Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On today's episode, we've got what might seem like an unlikely pairing, but one that makes sense when you dive into it. It's Rick Mataratanda from the band Goose and MC Taylor of His Golden Messenger. If you're not into the jam band world, Goose might not be super familiar to you yet, but in that world, the Connecticut band are absolutely massive, moving from clubs to amphitheaters over the past few years. And while jam bands themselves are pretty common, the barrier to entry isn't super high, very few have reached these heights. And after a decade, Goose already find themselves in the vaunted company of bands like Fish and The Grateful Dead. It's kind of obvious why. They are fantastic players, and their songs offer more than just extended noodling. It also makes sense that they're not influenced just by their jam forebears, but by jam-adjacent indie kingpins like Radiohead. And they've even got the stamp of approval of Vampire Weekend's Ezra Koenig, who asked them to cover his band's song 2021, and to stretch it out to 20 minutes and 21 seconds. You can find that on YouTube. The latest Goose album is Dripfield from 2022, but as you'll hear in this chat, they've got a couple more in the works already. Check out a little bit of their song, Give It Time, right here. Give it time, go ahead and give it hell. Give it all you got, give it up for something else. It's a revelation. As the primary creative force behind his golden messenger, MC Taylor has amassed an incredible catalog over the past 15 years or so. He was initially lumped in with the alt-country scene and later with the likes of Will Oldham and Bill Callahan. His records kind of defy categorization, though I should mention that 2019's Terms of Surrender was nominated for the Best Americana Album Grammy. Taylor's latest album as his golden messenger is called Jump for Joy, and the title is reflective of what's inside. It's looser and more playful and even groove-oriented at moments. A new move, but not an unwelcome one. Check out a little bit of the song Sanctuary right here. Like an arrow to the marrow, I know it feels like candy. Do it, make it to the other side. In this chat, Rick and MC talk about making studio records versus playing live, and they get into the fundamental question of how songs are written. Answer, it's different for everybody. They both reflect, oddly, on the Hare Krishna world, and Rick decides that Goose is more like a sitcom or a sports team than a band. Enjoy. How you doing, man? Good, man. Doing well. Where, Where are you? I'm home in Connecticut right now. About to head out and tour um, this weekend. Are you guys busy this summer? Uh, we're out all of June and then July and August. Uh, there's a couple little things, but mostly recording, rehearsing, a little bit of time off. Getting ready to make a record, or yeah, we've been we've been working on a couple records for about a year now, and uh, kind of closing in on finishing the first, and then you know the second will be closely after. That's fun to make records. I maybe prefer making records to. I mean. I, I love it all, but I really love being in the studio. I agree with you there. It's all good. The the nature of what we do, there's more emphasis on the live aspect of the whole thing. But, right. you know, yeah, I'm I'm a lover of the of records as well. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, I, so um, in like another lifetime, really, I worked as a folklorist for the state of North Carolina. And I found that my biggest sort of conversation hack anytime I was talking with someone that I didn't really know was to ask them what they had for breakfast. <laughs> but in this case, because we're both musicians, I was going to ask you what you're listening to right now. Mm. It kind of bops around. I've been listening to Tom York's solo records a lot recently. I dug Hosier's new record a lot, actually, recently. Yeah? Yeah, I like him a lot. I like his songs. Yeah, I was listening to that recently. Uh, Ilzy's new record is really awesome. Mm -hmm. I was spinning that for a while. Yeah. I guess it's not that new at this point, but what about you? I spend a lot of time with old music. I bet that you do, too. You know what's funny is I talk about this quite a bit, but I used to listen to a lot more old music, old jazz and old reggae and classical music. And, and you know, obviously the fish and dead thing is a big part of, you know, when I was younger, that was that was a big part of the formation of my outlook on things. And then at a certain point, I kind of discovered that there's actually people making really cool music now. Oh, I agree. And I, I got more into things that are happening now. Yeah, I mean, I feel that. 
I go back and forth. There's, of course, there's there's a bunch of stuff that uh, is contemporary that I I love, but I feel like my I don't know my brain is like still like searching for I don't know what the song that I haven't heard yet that I know is somewhere on one of these records that I have. <laughs> Do you feel like you've unearthed anything in recent years from the past? That I mean. There's always like an underlying hum of like Jamaican music, mm. like reggae, sort of roots era reggae. That's been the case for me for a really long time. So I feel like more it's like returning to some of that. I mean, either stuff that was recorded during that time, like in the, I don't know, the 70s, or stuff that I know that I just want to hear it again with my with my ears <laughs> now. I love the rhythmic component to that stuff too. I love the lyrical quality because it's so it's so devotional. It's essentially gospel music, right? Mm-hmm. But I love the rhythmic quality of it too. Like those, you know, it's like 20 musicians playing yeah. on thousands of records and making it all sound fresh. That part to me is still is pretty intriguing. What are some of the artists that stand out to you in that era? I've always really loved Burning Spear. That's like a big one for me. And there's an artist named Prince Allah that I love. I'm writing these down because I feel like uh, this is this is good. Oh, uh, I'll just make you a playlist. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's a guy named There's a guy named Yabby Yu that's a really big one for me. You know, the cool thing about reggae music is that Bob Marley, arguably the the biggest, most well known reggae act, still like absolutely smokes. Those records are unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah the old the old bob stuff i was listening to a lot of that at a certain point and you know because obviously everyone knows the big stuff you know but the right. the old the old when I, I was probably in college and i started listening to the old stuff i was like oh man right what a vibe yeah dude like the stuff where he was actually like you know like uh bunny whaler and peter tosh like they were all kids essentially yeah. <laughs> that stuff is so beautiful and so mind blowing. Was there some um, choir group of some kind that kind of like taught them or trained them at a certain point, and then they started to kind of really develop the, their their language with harmonies and things like that? I don't know if this is true, but I have heard that there was a guy named Joe Higgs that also made records. In fact, there's a record that he made called "Life of Contradiction" that is like unbelievable record in any genre not because the writing is so deep and if you haven't ever heard that you should find that one because it's 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 stunning i heard joe higgs i don't know if this is true is the one that like kind of showed them how to sing harmony but you know the other thing is i feel like bunny whaler is of certainly of that trio of dudes is kind of the unsung i don't know not, not hero, but in a way, like he had like the purest musical thing. I don't know what vision. Okay. Like I feel like Bob Marley had his sights set on the world. Yeah. In a way. He yeah. just, he knew that he could do something. I feel like Peter Tosh was kind of like a headstrong, militant dude, like pretty hardcore. And I feel like Bunny Whaler was like this pure Rastafarian soul. And like the stuff that he made after he left the Whalers is sort of like as high as you can get in terms of reggae music for me personally. That checks out. I, I, I could see that. There's a few DVDs I had back in the day. It's one called Island Reggae. And it was, it was I don't know, it was, it was kind of a some kind of bootleg thing. It seemed like a bunch of camcorder footage from Jamaica. <laughs> and it, it was like... It was amazing. It was so cool. Like what's uh, Jacob Miller like set up in a field in Jamaica, just just like going at it. It's probably like 200 people in this field and they're all just like sitting in the trees and smoking joints and listening to the show. And it's amazing, amazing footage. But there's an interview with Peter on there. And it's kind of it, it's a little bit of a bummer, I guess. But, it, you know, he was like seemingly pretty upset about the way the way the attention went. You know? Yeah, sure. I mean, it must have been wild. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a big world, worldly impact. That was, totally. That happened. What did you grow up listening to? Like, what got you to this place? Were your parents into music? I have a sister who's 10 years older than me, and she was listening to... The thing that always stands out when I get asked this question is, like, she was listening to a lot of Dave Matthews when I was, you know, 
three years old, right? Three or four or five, six, like when I was a really, really young child, right? I was hearing a lot of that music in the car. Uh-huh. <laughs> I remember like really disliking it at first, especially the live recordings, all the crowd and stuff like that. I was like, this is, this sucks. And then at Wait, certain, why, why the crowd? I don't know. I was just, I, I was probably in like a car seat, like just being like, this is whack with the crowd. And I don't know, something about like the live recordings was really unappealing to me. I feel like I have some live records where the applause is really loud. Like yeah. I, it's almost like, and these these would be like older records. Like maybe they didn't totally understand how to like include this information, the sonic information. I'm always like, why the fuck are the cl- is the clapping so loud? <laughs> I didn't get it at first. I mean, I think there were. I mean, music, when I was when I was a kid, music was like very, very impactful for me. I got like a, I had, you know, the Walkman with CDs and stuff or the Discman, I guess it was called, which was sick. And, you know, I, I had like an sync album that I would just dance to all the time. I just thought it was awesome because I was, yeah. you know, four years old in the 90s. <laughs> right. I was kind of like used to this, like, you know, slick production and stuff. And so the live recordings were, I just didn't get it at first. And then at a certain point it clicked. And I mean, it was probably like the Crash album that first did it. You know, the songs on there, like all of a sudden it all just made sense. And then I got, I got into his whole world. And, you know, I I, I love his writing, his band or monster players. Um, there's a, you know, it's a lot to chew on there um, musically, I, I found. So that was that was that was a big thing. And then, you know, as I got a little older in middle school and stuff, it was, you know, I, I, there was at that time, there was so many good hooks going up go like flying around in all different types of scenes and genres like the emo punk world you know was there was a lot of good songwriting going on there especially and also just like the radio so it's kind of just like chasing hooks like like you're talking like melodic hooks yeah just like good songwriting in the late 90s early 2000s that it was pop and and whatever but that was uh I was always just taken. I'd hear a song on the radio and, and be like, oh my God, what is that? And then I'd go try to find it on Napster or LimeWire. After that, I just got to high school, started smoking weed and started studying jazz and listening to the dead and, and fish and, and things like that. And that kind of like took over my world for a while. Is that when you started playing guitar? No, I, oh, I started playing guitar in middle school. I was listening to a, um, a lot of like dispatch and things like that. And I was just writing a lot. I still gravitated towards improvising, which, interestingly, because even when I, I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know any, I didn't like theory wasn't clicking for me at that point. Um, but I was still kind of just, I, I put a band together and we would do these long jams where I was just like, we were just like searching and noodling around and trying to find stuff. And a lot of it was, just, you know, utter bullshit, but. I mean, isn't that, isn't that still the way it is? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Touche. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's funny that instinct was kind of always there. But I, I got to high school and uh, had a teacher that was pushing jazz on me a lot. And for a long time, I kind of understood that it was a heightened form of of the language. You know, it was, there's just way more going on there technically. You know, I kind of had the right. idea like if you if I understood that language, I could understand any of it basically because it's it's mm-hmm. the most it's the most intricate. So at, at first, it really didn't do anything for me. It wasn't enjoyable. It didn't hit me. I used to like spin West Montgomery records it like on repeat while I slept in high school just to try to like get it in my subconscious in my brain. And I think the the real turning point was when I started slowing it down to transcribe the solos and stuff like that. And I was right. like I was 15 and stoned and you know getting off on fish jams but trying to trying to understand this this other this music, you know. And it was when I started slowing it down that I was like, "Oh my god, this is this is like the dopest jam I've ever heard, just too fast for me to understand it in real time." So then that was kind of the breaking point and then gradually I, I started to it started to hit me more and i started to enjoy it more so like what jazz or besides west montgomery what is the stuff that like it really hit you i was a huge bill evans fan i mean as far as guitar goes the lineage of like charlie christian west montgomery you know west montgomery grew up listening to charlie christian and then you know the generation that grew up listening to west montgomery like the uh, schofield Metheny, bill frizzell those guys that was kind of like um, Schofield's probably was was my favorite. He's he's from around here too. If I had to pick one, he'd probably be my favorite guitar player. But everyone's got their impact and their voice, and they're all they're all amazing. What's that? Um, is it a go go that record he made with Mendesky, Martin, and Wood? For a while on the last big tour we were on, that was like our backstage like pump up 
getting ready to go on stage music. Nice. Not that the crowd was hearing it, but we were just playing it in the back every night. <laughs> totally. There's kind of like a handful of things that I go to when, you know, musically speaking, is like guitar playing. I, I When I'm feeling stagnant or like I'm up against a wall, there's, that's one of the things I'll I'll go to and just and just play with. And it usually kind of ignites the fire again. Speaking of being 15 years old, I have a 15 year old son. And in the past year, he's gotten really into music and really into playing. He's a bass player. I never have pushed music on him. And I feel like all my musical music friends all say the same thing. Like, I, I you know, just because of how I grew up or my relationship to music that feels so sacred. Like I, I've never pushed music on him, hmm. but there have always been in, instruments all over the house, records everywhere. There's always music playing. So it's not super surprising. He's not like actually composing yet, but he's gotten into the idea of writing songs and like has been asking me, how do you write a song? And, mm -hmm. you know, that's like a question that anyone that does like, in, that's a songwriter that does interviews gets, a, gets asked a lot, but I don't know if I like take the question that seriously when it's coming from a stranger, right? Like, just like, I don't know, you just work on some chords, find a melody, the words will appear maybe that will fit the melody, the melodic mood. But like having to answer the question to my son is like, a whole other thing because mm -hmm. like now I'm like taking it seriously. <laughs> what is the start of writing a song actually? How do you write a song? You know, it's funny. As soon as you brought that up, I was I like, I, you know, I want to ask you that because I feel like I, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to write a song. Yeah. I think the goal is to never actually know. I think that's, that is, is maybe the, like, that's the thing that I always, kind of want to keep in my back pocket is like, you know, don't, don't try and think that there's a code to this because the song is going to get bad really fast if you start using a formula. <laughs> totally. I, and I've, I've, I've gone through phases. I'm not, not necessarily thinking in a formulaic way, but yeah, I've gone through many phases of writing just whack shit because I was trying to do something, you know? Totally. So have I, man. I have hard drives full of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, but I think I was the most creative when I was like 13 and 14 and 15. I, I got the, I got a guitar and I didn't know how to play. And I just was like making things up. I was just making songs because that's what it felt. That's what was exciting. What felt natural. And then I, don't know, I stopped writing when I started smoking weed and learned how mm. to play, but I, I couldn't, I, I no longer was like seeing ideas through. You know, right. And that's that's maybe been the hardest part since then is uh, it's like the start of it. The start I, ideas begin often and easily. Mm -hmm. It's seeing them through that um, I've come to find is the challenge. As someone that does so much improvisation, do you think that makes it harder to like write a song that is concise? Are you able to like concentrate on the actual meat and potatoes of the like contained song when you know in your head, like, we're going to take this on the stage and it's going to grow into something completely different? I, I think that's like a, a sensibility that's that's just been evolving with time. I, my sense of time in writing has always been really warped. Yeah. You know, for a very long time, I'd write a song and feel like it was just a normal length song. And it, but it was, you know, a six, seven minute song. Right. Like the, like the form is the meat of the song is that long. And it's. Yeah, right, right. There's no like no jams or anything. It's just I, I don't know why it was so warped. But now I'm like, how do you write? <laughs> how do you write a three minute song? That's yeah. like, that has all the things. So I'm like more, more fascinated by that. I mean, for the type of thing we're doing, the longer form things serve it well, you know, yeah. it, it, it's more of a story. We play three hour shows every night. So it's, it's kind of like, right. it feels better having these things that you exist in for a longer period of time, but also it'd be sick to have some short bangers, you know? And I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, honestly, try to flirting with that idea, try to figure out that at this point. Yeah. The art of writing a song is, it feels pretty mysterious. I mean, I'm maybe like anything else. I, I do a little bit of painting, not any, not anything that I would ever 
ever really show uh, <laughs> anybody, <laughs> but you know, it does, it does feel there's a lot of similarity, I think in any like creative practice of, of just like, I don't know. I'm just kind of searching. I don't actually know what I'm what I'm doing. I don't really know the language very well. Do you do you start with lyrical ideas or musical ideas or is it exclusive? Is it does it vary? I have the most success when I have like a strong melodic something. Hmm. Or, or or like a rhythmic phrasing. Yeah, like you know because a, a compelling melody however complicated or simple it is, can really like transform a set of ordinary chord changes into something totally different. That that to me is like one really magical thing about writing a song is the way that just a couple layers of musicality, like a set of chord changes and a melody can make something that make something sound totally new. That's really made up of like the constituent parts are not, are just, they're just whatever. So you prefer to have a melody that you're writing to? I just find that I have more luck finishing a song when I have something that is fun to like wrap my voice around, I mm -hmm. guess. Which is a little funny because sometimes I feel like people think of hiss as like a, as a more of a, like a, I don't know what, a wor word based or something um, musical project. But I never totally thought of it like that. <laughs> I sort of do now, like I, I understand. Um, but uh, yeah, I've always been like such a, a rhythmic, rhythmic person. So that's often what I'm chasing, even when it's just me and a guitar. I can relate to that. The rhythmic thing is the most effortless and natural. If you're, if you're lucky. Yeah, everyone's different. The way some people write, I'm like, fuck, I could never, I could never write like that, you know? And that's, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. It is such a mysterious and fascinating thing. So check this out. I was listening to one of y'all's live records, the Radio City one today, and you start the record with um, that tune called California Magic, right? Yeah. And in that song, you have this verse, I guess. I don't know if you wrote it or, or someone else in the band wrote it, that goes, preacher on a beach with a megaphone preaching, listen up, you heathens, I think these waves are going to save you. And I have this song called California King that came out last year also. And there's a verse in it that says, some prophets sing about bad things to all their Sunday sinners. They set their nets out on the shore to catch the lonely surfers, which is <laughs> like, <laughs> those are, those are connected. Those there's feel some, connect, connected in some way. Definitely some DNA there. <laughs> that kind of made me, made me chuckle. I was like listening to that and it kind of rewound it. I was like, wait, what the hell did he just say? <laughs> Whoa. I recognize that sentiment. But I grew up in Southern California and spent a lot of time at the beach. And um, this was the era where Hare Krishnas were very everywhere, including all over the Southern California beaches. And um, yeah, we used to go to the Krishna temple and eat dinner and all kinds of stuff. So. I, got in, I got into that scene for a minute too. I just stumbled upon them one day and I, I ran into them in town, but they'd, they'd have a, a kirtan at, at the, the college in Fort Collins mm -hmm. once a week. Um, and I got close with them and started going down to Denver a lot at, at their place. And yeah, I, I kind of fell in love with the scene of it. Or I'm not, I don't know if the scene of it is the right term, but you know, the, the community, the, um, they were, they were really amazing people. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, they were actually a really fantastic musicians too. They were great, yeah. like great players, great singers. This, um, this one guy was like, went to study jazz, jazz drums. He was a drummer in college and, uh, he played the Verdunga. There's another guy who played the harmonium and sang really beautifully and just these great, it was like great conversations that would happen and this amazing food that they were cooking. I didn't really know about Indian food before that. And uh, yeah, I got pretty deep in the scene for a minute. Yeah, that's it, cool. It, it was cool. It was cool. A really, really cool experience. Yeah. When was that? Uh, that was 2014. Yeah. So what is, what's coming up for you now? Just, I mean, musically or I don't know what, spiritually, whatever you, wherever you want to go. You said you're going on tour. We're going on tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
you know, the band band went through change recently. So we're pretty in that process of finding the new ways um, and exploring the new ways and exploring new things, which is pretty exciting. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty stoked for this tour. So you have a, you have a new drummer, right? Right. And is this, is this the first tour with this? First prop? Yeah. We've, we've played uh, now five, well, I guess technically six shows, but yeah, we just played a, kind of a few one-off-y kind of things uh, up to this point. And uh, yeah, this is the first proper tour with him. It's feeling good. It's exciting. I mean, a, a new drummer is a big thing. It is a big thing. It's like a hard thing to even, if you're in a position of having to find a new drummer, or not even find a new drummer, but teach a drummer a catalog, it's hard to even wrap my mind around having done it a few times. It's a lot because you, I mean, you, but, but, but it can also be super, super exciting. And like, just, yeah, that kind of like fresh rhythmic sense can lift everything. Drums are, it's, it is, it really is the most <laughs> with what you're talking about. Drums is the most that, you mm -hmm. know, it takes time to really build all of the connective tissue of a catalog. Yeah. Especially rhythmically speaking mm -hmm. and finding, finding all the nooks and crannies, especially with you know, a bunch of seven minute songs, you know, that turn into 15 minute songs. Right. There's a lot of rhythmic elements and like in your guys last proper studio record, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. I guess the, one of the goals of this type of thing is to try to go different places, you know, and, and, try to not have any rules about that kind of thing about where 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 are you going so are you hands on like in in terms of the process of sort of breaking someone new into the band are you are you like stopping songs midway through and like wait wait play it like this i'm sort of in my band having had many people come through i'm kind of like famously hands off if someone's doing something really egregious i'll be like uh oh, no no not that but otherwise like uh you know, my bass player has always been like, I, I had no idea what you wanted. Uh, it's like, <laughs> I was like, well, if it was bad, you would have known. But, you know, there's like a lot of different ways to a lot of different ways to to sort of function as the band leader, essentially. What's what's your philosophy with that? Like if if something's going feeling a certain way, but you prefer it a different way, you kind of just don't remark on it. You just let it go with the new way that you prefer less if, maybe if something's really bugging me i'll say something but usually like i'll just start out like these are the things that i love about the music of his gold messenger i love a 16th note mm. there's always got to be a 16th note going right so if you're stepping into the drum chair for the first time or really like any position in the band, I'm just like, just keep in mind that what I'm hearing is a 16th note, <laughs> even if it's not actually present in the music, mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm subdividing in that way. So, and that's really important to me, you know, just they're like little rules or not even rules, but just stuff that I guess that's my philosophy. It's just like, I'll tell them like my likes and my, my icks, as the kids say. Yeah. And I don't know. I'm not trying to be aloof about it. I'm more like wanting people to understand that, like, they're in the room for a reason because they we've gotten to the point where they're sitting in a Hiskold Messenger rehearsal. So there's something compelling that they're doing. And I just want to see them bring their thing into the mix. Yeah. If there's an idea there and you kind of see things feeling a certain way, communicating that in in uh you know the most non-egregious way possible is is part of the you know the thing but also kind of always keeping an eye out and and being mindful and having the goal of everyone's personality being able to breathe and being able to shine right in its way and, and speak in its way and be part of the fold which you know it is regardless that's that's right. you know one th one thing i've you know felt and observed of you know my years of doing bands and stuff like that any every everyone who's part of the circuit they're affecting the energy of of the thing regardless of whether or not they're you know speaking out or or whatever it is like energetically speaking it is a circuit and anyone who's in the circuit is is affecting the circuit totally so yeah it's a you know finding the right e equations with that kind of thing is is has been an, it's always an interesting it's been an interesting journey. We've gone through a lot of lineup changes, this band, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's I don't know, how, what's what's your philosophy with, with Hiss? I mean, it's not a set band. Like, you, you move through different formations as kind of as part of it. Yeah, I mean, 
it has been the same for people al- alongside me for the past several years. And so when I think of Hiss now, I think of it as a band with a consistent lineup um, for as long as I can keep it that way. It's it's really fucking hard. Mm-hmm. Because of scheduling or because of... No, it's just like, it's tough. I mean, because I write the songs. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I'm, yeah. for all intents and purposes, I'm the boss. And I, I don't think that anybody would dispute, you know? I mean, all, all of these, all the, everyone in the band is, is, are my closest friends, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, I'm responsible for everything. Is it Matt, Matt, your, your drummer? He's kind of like your, your guy. M- what? No, actually, uh, Matt McCon. Yeah. Matt McCon played drums for many years, um, and has played on many Hiss records. I never felt like I could, I could totally have him because he, he played in Bon Iver and, mm-hmm. um, you know, anytime a Bon Iver tour came up, he was going to, I knew he was going to be gone. Yeah. Um, but my, my drummer for the past several years has been a guy named Nick Falk, who okay. is ah. incredi- incredible, incredible. I know Nick. Drummer. Yeah. I, I, uh, that's so funny. I haven't seen him in a really, really long time, but I spent some time with him in Key West in 2000, in the fall of 2011. Mm-hmm. He was playing with, um, he's playing with this guy, Eric robertson this this crazy mandolin player yeah met them through the berkeley thing yeah yeah he's incredible he's he's heavy 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 guy yeah he's 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 a deep one and um i love him you know i I feel like super super excited anytime i get to play with him and he has an incredible 16th note um (laughs) 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 that like i'm basically asking him to play for like two and a half hours a night yeah but and anyway like so i guess my sense about like lineups and stuff like that is like i prefer to have a consistent lineup because it makes everything a, a million times easier and mm-hmm. i still like love the idea this super romantic idea of a band yeah. you know right i'm in my mid 40s and like it's that still like that idea still moves me but i also love I love the idea that I can be like sort of fleet footed enough that if I'm like feeling some kind of hiss something and I need to go somewhere else to work on it with somebody else, I can do that too, which is kind of like what I've been doing this year. I kind of told myself and everybody that like, this was going to be sort of a quiet year for hiss in terms of touring and stuff. Like I got to go, I got to go like check out a few things. Um, and and it's all like totally amorphous. There's nothing like weird about it. It's just me exploring because otherwise I was going to just like wreck, wreck this thing. Are there particular things that you have your sights on that you're exploring that, or is it, is it really pretty open at this point? It's mostly that I've been writing songs with a lot of people, which are not necessarily songs that would be for hiss, but Just like checking back in with like my songwriting muscles, just in terms of like thinking of melody and stuff that feels Mm -hmm. like it has been important the last couple months. And I do this other thing that's called Revelators. It's all like just weird instrumental, sort of like jazzy dub, just weird stuff that I do with my friend Cameron Ralston in, in Virginia. So... We've been making a new Revelators record, um, and our and our buddy JT Bates, a drummer. JT Bates yeah. is, is an amazing drummer. Uh, he's my he's mind blowing, yeah. mind blowing. He's the he's the man. I, I I always get him and BJ Burton mixed up. Oh, I mean, same same physical area. <laughs> <laughs> I just those two names. I always screw up those two names for some reason. Yeah, but yeah, they're they're yeah. JT Bates is incredible. One of my favorite drummers. Yeah. Well, you should you should hear this this Revelator stuff. It's it's might be interesting to you. Anyway, what's your thinking about a band in twenty twenty four? Well, we're sort of operating in this in in a particular lineage, this world that we're kind of operating in. That it's you know the type of band we are. The band is like it's like almost more like a sports team or like a sitcom than like a <laughs> you know you know what I mean. Yeah. So like, so you have, there's a Costanza in your band. <laughs> I guess if you look at that different ways, who, who the Costanza is, but yeah, I mean, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. It's always just felt like a natural thing, like a, like a world I 
I've always just had a gravitation towards that world. Right. You know? And I have, you know, on the side, I romanticize about the kind of thing that you're talking about, having an outlet that that um, is able to just go different places and, and be swift footed. That idea is is alluring to me in some in some respect, not not at the expense of, you know, what we're working on, what we're building in, in yeah. that world. I mean, the thing is, you can you can do it all. If you're willing to stay up late enough. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, the time thing is, is the trick. But yeah, I don't know. My philosophy of bands, um, it's always, I've kind of just, I've sort of never not done it. Yeah. I don't think about it that much because I haven't had much space from it. Yeah, right. Ever. And the times I have had space from it have actually been pretty prolific times for me, which, you know, is, is sort of something I'm trying to figure out now. You know, there's the there periods when there wasn't this this thing that uh, you know had like an underlying demand. Were the times I write the most when no one's looking? Yeah, you know, and it, that's not if you want to be able to do both. That doesn't you know it's not it's not a very sustainable way. Right. Uh, and I'm I'm sure in time I can I can build I can I can you know we can do things that that create more space and create you know enough enough time. To, uh, to get into those that mode, but right. for now it's you know we're we're working and um, you know I think of on on the prowl for ways to keep the songwriting muscles fit while touring and doing all this stuff. You know, yeah. Can you write on the road? I haven't really been able to, but I'm constantly trying to find different ways into that. Do you? Sometimes, but not a lot. Like I, I, I could probably count on one hand the the amount of songs that I've written over my whole career that were written while I was traveling. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that people can do it, but I feel like my consciousness needs to be in like a regular place to like to get the stuff going. <laughs> Interestingly, if I'm if I'm traveling alone, which I don't do much at all, but if I'm on the move alone. Mm -hmm. then I find it's, it's, it's actually more provoking, you know, more, more is moving than if I'm just kind of sitting at home. What's your, this is what I want to ask you. What's your like writing? How do, if you, if you have a day, how do you, yeah. and you, and you want to write, you want to work on things. What's your, what's your setup? What's your, um, uh, what are your strategies? Yeah. How do you do it? Um, I mean like the nuts and bolts of it. If I were like, I'm going to write a song today, um, I probably would start by like going through some, my voice memos mm -hmm. and like find cause there's always some, some memo that's labeled like good <laughs> or, <laughs> or, uh, don't forget yeah. or something, something like that. I'll find that because there's usually a set of chords and a melody and, and maybe a couple words I will come into my little studio where I'm at right now and poke around on usually a guitar, usually an acoustic guitar and like kind of like sharpen slash whittle the melody into something that starts to suggest words. You know how like, you know how if you sing gibberish enough times, it can start to turn into words. We call them mumbies. Yeah. Yeah. Like just mumble, mumble tracks, basically. Like I'll even do that when I start recording the song, like in Pro Tools, it's just kind of like mumbling and stuff starts to bubble up. So you, okay, record the mumbies. Do you ever like multi, uh, like double and triple the mumbies in attempts to try to extract things? Yeah, I mean, I'll have like a notebook. Like I have just a million of these little moleskin yeah. notebooks. These are like my just the thing that I always have with me. And generally, like, I will just be poking around in these notebooks for something that, like, either has a word that feels like it fits the um, emotion of the melody or, like, something that has the right syllable count. You know, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't discount a word that has the right amount of syllables. That's, like, <laughs> a really... That's, kind yeah. of, that's, like, a super helpful thing to have. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I feel like writing a song has maybe started to take me a little bit longer than it used to. Like, I, I, it used to be that I could probably, like, finish a song in a day, which is not still not unthinkable, but I just feel, I find 
that I'm not like in the same kind of rush that I used to be about finishing a song. Hmm. So, you know, it might take me a couple days. I feel like the process is, is about keeping myself interested. Mm -hmm. So like, how long can I keep myself interested? Can I keep myself interested long enough to actually finish words that are like, I like these words. Can I keep myself interested long enough to like come up with some second line melodic stuff that is, you know, can I, can I keep myself interested to like actually start calling people over to like add stuff to it? It's all like different levels of, but it's all just trying to keep myself interested in the idea. <laughs> makes sense. Well, lyrically speaking, do you feel like you, uh, you know, when you're writing in that sort of, you know, subconscious kind of way, do you usually end up with some kind of narrative or story there that's intellectualized on any level? Or do you really allow it to be free form subconscious, lyrically speaking? I generally am keeping it free, but that's not ever really been a rub for me because I think I think the perception is that his lyrically speaking is is somewhat abstract. I'm generally not telling a story that is totally discernible to the listener. I always know exactly what what the narrative is in my head in every every single hiss song. Like I could tell you what is going on with that set of images, but you know, so maybe in that in that way, the fact that like my words do appear sort of abstractly, it kind of like leaves me free to just kind of like search around in the cosmos or in the sort of existential whatever clouds. I am generally trying to like have a, there be a consistency through the song, if that makes sense. Definitely really interesting talking about all this stuff. We should exchange phone numbers so I can send you some some shit. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. Great to chat with you, man. You too. Congrats on everything. You guys are having a, a huge time. It's very awesome to see. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast. And thanks to Rick Mataratanda and MC Taylor for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please check out all the good stuff at TalkHouse.com and follow us on your favorite podcasting platform. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan and the TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.